Well, though Canadian singer-songwriter Feist was already something of an indie star thanks to her acclaimed sophomore effort, Let It Die, 2007's The Reminder made Feist a bona fide star around the world as the album earned Juno Awards, the prestigious Shortlist Music Prize in America, as well as Grammy and Polaris Prize nominations. And while much of The Reminder's success can be attributed to Feist's nimble, emotive voice, her songcraft, and her introspective, relatable lyrics, as a new doc- documentary film makes clear Feist's triumphs were shared by a rather large and talented group of friends and colleagues. The doc is called Look at What the Light Did Now, an intriguing behind-the-scenes look at the creative process, not that of a single artist, but of a group of musicians, visual artists, choreographers, and filmmakers working on something together. And I'm pleased to have the film's central character, singer-songwriter Leslie Feist, and the film's director, Anthony Sack, here with me in Studio Q. Hello, you two. Hello. Hello. What a pleasure it is to have you here. So great to be on cue. <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is <laughs> such a fascinating film. Not not just because it pulls back the curtain on everything that helped make the reminder uh, a big hit and you a big star, but because uh, it's really about the collective. I mean, it, it, you know, stars usually put out DVDs about themselves or with focus on on uh, promoting uh, the person at the center of it all. This seems to be about everyone around you. Tell me about that. Uh, well, I'm a little sick of myself, I guess. <laughs> no, I, I, I had a, I mean, my day-to-day experience uh, working around the record, you know, touring or, um, you know, in the studio or all the preparations around and making all the materials that then kind of border the album and sort of give it some shape or as far as, uh, you know, visual materials and stuff and what the, show, the shows are going to look like and stuff. You know, that it, for me involves so many amazing characters you know these these real characters you know and and their sparking minds were what gave me most of any fuel that I had to continue through the sort of you know the day-to-day what that actually is to to be on tour or to be making stuff like that that in, innately is a little uncomfortable because it's about yourself you know so those people for me were my kind of core uh stabilizers or something so and it felt like time to to shed uh, to put the spotlight on them i mean was that was this a conscious thing to talk uh, to to expose the world to the sparking minds you just talked about yeah revenge no (laughs) 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 on the photographer it's pretty soft revenge yeah i know i know (laughs) make everybody look good for making you look good right yeah i'm i realized that no nobody uh we actually just came up with this. Anthony and I came up with this analogy a minute ago about light, a light bright. You know, your name and lights, but it's all the pixels or you know all the all the. If it was a light bright, it would be each little each little lamp were, were these people. Right. You know, so in a way, the project carried my name, but they really carried me. These people, right. you know, and more than of course than we could, the film shows. There's even more people. You know, the people that. You know the lawyers and the accountants and stuff. All of so whom, are, all of whom are sitting behind the glass yeah. right now. All of whom like, are named Chip Sutherland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Anthony, uh, this this is four years of footage of of uh, shooting uh, stuff from all over the world, uh, uh, studio sessions to live footage. But this didn't start as a documentary for you, right? No, it started as an archive process. You know, we were just we were just um, what was I doing? I was just. I was making webisodes. I was doing that sort of thing. But I was also realizing that when these things were going on, there was something more going on than just what was going on. You know, the one, two, three, four video. Shall we go back on that? I'm trying to. When these things were going on, I felt I, there was I, more I, going he on. He must be one of the sparking minds you're talking yeah, about. That's, yeah, that's. I can't. Yeah. A, yeah. Well, we can go slow mo <laughs> on that one. Well, Anthony's <laughs> contribution in a weird way, he, as one of the main characters of the film, was making the film. The sort of metafiction of, you know, his contribution wasn't an interview and commentary. Right. It was right. uh, the, the document of the documentary in a way, you know, to have him, that was his contribution. You but, know? but when did you know that th- th- this should be a document, this should be a film? I just always knew there was something special going on. And, you know, back, back, back in my mind, I was hoping, well, let's hope we can do something with this sometime. But I really felt, you know, this was something special to capture and capture properly and try to get a perspective beyond the perspective that was happening at the time. It was like, if there's one camera on one, two, three, four going through all these things, what about all these dancers that are behind breathing and trying to make their cues on time? And what happens when all those dancers actually get behind you and start getting excited? And let's see that from another from another angle. And, and that's that was sort of a 
a, a sort of a perspective that carried through throughout the whole process was the center was Leslie's music, but outside of that center were all these people that were standing behind her and, uh, and supporting her. Yeah, well, that's, her. that's kind of an interesting analogy, sort of By jump right means, on in ahead. here. Yeah, yeah. Just, it's an interesting analogy because that video is is very noticeably one perspective. It's one eye that weaves around this, you know, as as Patrick says in the film, it's a it's a moving, living sculpture that's seen from one particular vantage point that's been so carefully chosen or something. And you can maybe say that any public, you know, presence of a project that's been created, this multidimensional mm -hmm. or whatever, the person on the other end, whoever's absorbing it and observing it, they're seeing one thing from their one perspective. So I was aware that they didn't see everything I saw. You know, I saw all of these other pieces of the puzzle. So in a way, that's sort of a good analogy. Anthony showed the side perspective, you know, the sidelines. But all this emphasis on the artistic collective around you, if you will, is not inconsistent with one of the through lines, like one of the subtexts of this film, which seems to be your discomfort with being... Uh, at the center of attention, uh, at least on camera, as a star. Uh, you're, you're a photographer, uh, Mary Rossi, who you've worked with extensively, characterizes you as someone who is always in uncomfortable in front of the camera. That's in what general. she's. In <laughs> general. Wh wh why? Where does that discomfort come from? Come from? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I mean. I don't know. I just live it that way. I mean. I mean. I maybe it was from being a part of so many other people's bands you know I was uh, I was in a lot of bands I mean uh, um, I'd say probably half of the people who I've played with it over the years have at some point been in by divine right you know beside Jose Contreras who you know we all cut our teeth and uh, you know I, I would toured with Peaches and Gonzalez and you know mm -hmm. I was on the side a lot I got to observe what this film is kind of about through other people's versions of it from the side I got to see what can happen within in that sort of you know the, the caught in the headlights kind of moment right. for people and maybe I, I got used to seeing things from that perspective so all of a sudden to be in the center doesn't necessarily you know it's not necessarily the easiest fit or but it, it's, I mean it's not all of a sudden you know you have been doing yeah, you've no, had true. a solo <laughs> career for almost a, for a decade really and and it does seem like a paradox right to launch this solo career uh, to become mega, mega, mega successful but to to actually be quite shy about wanting the camera on you what 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 can you identify what it is in that moment when mary's taking your photo or these cameras are on you right now that or you're in front of them that that uh, that makes you feel less than that gives you the dis-ease uh well i, I was uh, i began uh, i began all of this by being interested in audio and in, in the audible part of things you know it was never Besides playing shows, 99% of what's going on is just with your ears. Your ears are engaged, you know, your, your hands and your ears, you know. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and home recording especially, being tucked away in a basement, you know, dank basement, uh, coming up with ideas or whatever, all of that is, it doesn't engage that other part of, you know, it's just not part of the picture. Mm. I love and that I, it has to be a dank basement. Yeah, well, especially in Ontario, you know. The romance. The dehumidifier yeah. rumbling romantically right, in the right, corner. Right, right. <laughs> So I don't know. I was never really th that. I know I shouldn't say all of a sudden, but um, oh man, I remember the first photos I ever, you know, Yael Stev, who has since gone on to make lots of films and stuff. She, she took, you know, she was a aspiring photographer. Took awkwardly at Trinity Bellwoods, and I, you know, and when I was putting out Monarch and. You know, it was, you know, a roll of film and spent the $28 to get it developed. And there was one that worked. And I mean, those are, you know, it, it was just a less part. It was just a tiny afterthought to put a photo on the back of an album back when I made my first record in 98 or whatever. And so it increasingly became more important, mm -hmm. but it didn't necessarily mean I became increasingly more comfortable with it. Or Even with the reminder, yeah. people have to convince you. Uh, not just industry folks, but your close friends, that it's okay for your face. In fact, it's a good thing for your head, your face, to be on the front <laughs> cover of the of the record because you didn't want that, right? Um, uh, every girl deals with their own vanity issues or something. I just don't necessarily want that to be the the thing I face when I'm playing in St. Louis and open the local paper to see what's going on that afternoon that I have the day off and to see some photograph that doesn't feel recognizably like who I feel like every day or something. Right. I mean, it's it's really maybe selfish. You just want to be comfortable. And um, 
maybe I've just really messed myself up even worse now by making a film to draw attention to my discomfort because then ultimately when you're uncomfortable, you just want to shrink into it and have no one notice. Anthony, so. you're shaking your head. I want to get your insight on this. I mean, what did you learn about uh, Leslie's desire to not be the center of attention by making a film about her? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what have we done? <laughs> I uh, it's a great film, by the way. I'm yeah. not. I'm not taking anything out of. I, I, I mean, it's, it's very curious. But that's not a big part of the film, actually. I grew up in Africa, right? Did and, you? Uh, right? Yeah, well, for a lot of time. And there's a big, not a big, but it's a very much an, an African sort of feeling that you know we all know about the soul being stolen by the camera. And I don't. I really don't. I don't believe a sort of um, having an sort of a knee-jerk reaction to photography and to cameras is a bad thing because I do think it's about, uh, I do think it's intrusive and I think um, because you want to protect something that's based on audio, you know, video killed the radio star, there's nothing, I don't feel there's anything odd about it at all, um, but it's not something that we do focus on in the film because it's not as as important an issue. It's something that people like to chew on, but they don't like to chew on that. They like to hear the music on the radio. They like to hear the music. That's what it's about. It's about mm -hmm. the music. And um, visually, we tried to make something expressive and, and experimental that was about more than gossip, you know, or that sort of Maybe feel. we could just flip the script and say that this was all a master plan on my part to, to draw from Mary Rossi, the photographer, some <laughs> new instinct that she has never, you know, Maybe we could just say, instead of her trying to figure me out, I'm actually just pretending to be not <laughs> right, into right. having my photo taken right, to right. thus, you know, I knew that's what it yeah, was. Yeah, no, this is all on purpose. I knew this it. Is, yeah, At least it's been admitted here. <laughs> but you do like, you, you like sharing the attention, and you also like having people around you. It's interesting watching the, uh, the footage of the reminder being made, the record being made. Um, because some people, especially when it comes to a singer-songwriter, a solo artist, might have this romantic notion of the person in isolation recording. And that's absolutely not the case with you uh, when you're making the reminder. You're surrounded by musicians who are trading ideas and playing parts, and uh, it's not just you in the room. And you say, for this record, when you, the reminder being the, the record, you wanted personalities pushing against each other. Tell me about how that benefits your art. Um, well, I've worked for a long time with Gonzalez, you know, Chile Gonzalez, who I know you've had on the show before, and and um, also Maki, another Canadian, another uh, really old friend, and who moved to Europe as well. And um, we worked for a long time together, me on their projects, them on my projects. No matter what the the title of the album or whose record it is, ultimately we're all there to serve the our role in the in the you know process or whatever. And and we've. You know, there, there's been lots of push and pulls in that. There's lots of disagreement and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, core, I think that's a terrible idea, or core, you know, whatever the, the fight would be about, what instrumentation or whatever, you know, all the millions of things that you're going to argue about. But what is always, I've always remarked on with those guys and what they notice too is that it's not the egos clashing ever. It's not, well, this is my, you know, I'm pulling Power of Vito, this is my record or whatever. It's it's the ideas duking it out. And you can, I, I can get behind an idea and I can fight for the right of an idea, but ultimately the ideas are going to be the ones deciding. You know, it's not, I'm not going to pull some master move and say, well, it's my record. And I, you know, ultimately if, if a, one of the other ideas wins, it dukes out in the, in the gladiator, you know, like a uh, realm. Once you try, it beco becomes clear which one wins. But and, even so, and those are personalities have to be the ones to t to bring those ideas to the room. You know? Even more so, you wanted those collision, that 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 collision of people's ideas, because you say at one point you wanted mistakes. You wanted what you call a margin for error. Hmm. Uh, tell me about that. Why would you want mistakes? Uh, they're so interesting. They're. Those, those happy accidents, you know, it's a cliche to say happy accident. Well, it's, it's, it can be such a, such a, you can think you've got it all figured out and then something accidentally can happen. And, you know, maybe they say they, the first time maybe someone discovered cooking meat was an accident or the, you know, maybe well, the- I was gonna say maple syrup. I was just thinking about maple syrup. Yeah, I mean, when there's they threw a log on a fire and it came trickling out, you know? Oh, well, tasty. Yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> so that's a tasty accident and there's happy accidents. And there's, there's surprises you know, with accidents, right? Yeah, there's, exactly. It's, um, and maybe it comes from when I lived uh, on Queen Street years ago and I was four tracking a lot and there, you know, it's 24 hour streetcar outside. 24-hour, you know, motorbike hangout, like, and, you know, party constant, 
you know, 3 a.m. people spilling out into the street and there's just this cacophony coming from the street at all times. I think that's why now I can sleep through anything. But um, I remember one day recording something and hearing a fire engine because the fire station's not far from there. And, you know, I don't know what's that effect called where the pitch bends as it gets further and closer, you know, the Doppler, Doppler effect. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. And it was exactly in time in rhythm and in key to whatever I was working on at that mm -hmm. moment. And I remembered just, I don't think I'd ever had a more exciting moment by myself. You, know? you don't want antiseptic. You don't want it to sound manufactured. That's part of it, right? Yeah. How, how do you choose the personalities with which, and I know you're gonna say that they're the friends of yours, but I mean, you make, you know, you, you make decisions. How do you choose who you want to surround yourself with to make mistakes with? <laughs> yeah, wow. exactly. That's great. Well, Maki says in the film, he says that it's a conversation. And, and, and um, you know, uh, when you walk into a room, if you just start screaming at the top of your lungs and not let anyone get a word in edgewise, that is not a very interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit predictable because you know what's going to come out of your own mouth. So, so basically, you're not getting anything out of that. You're just talking. You're just filling up the air, filling up the space. So... I mean, having a guy who can phrase that, that's a mind that is going to understand silence being just as powerful as contribu contributions and and um, dropping something and realizing and having your ear open enough to realize when you drop something, it's going to, you know, I was just working with him a couple weeks ago and I happened to pick up a bag, a tote bag that was hanging on a nail next to the drum area and, and I picked it up because it had like a thousand in percussion instruments in it. And I carried it over in the middle of recording something, and I, I just sort of started pushing it on the bottom of it. And it made this incredible, deep, like, unexpected, like, just sort of like almost like a kick drum mixed with a maraca mixed with 19,000 other accidental things. There was paper crumpled up in there, whatever. But it was him who was like, I'm going to get his wife, Desiree, who makes clothes. He's like, I'm going to take that home and get her to sew it shut. So it's a permanent <laughs> accident. You brilliant, know, brilliant. Yeah, Permanent so that's accident. there's people like that. that. You know, <laughs> Permanent, a recurring accident. Uh, <laughs> do you do you think that artists are? Do you think people are afraid of that kind of recording? I mean, is that why it doesn't happen more? No, I don't think so. I think I'm, no, I'm, I'm shaking my head. I'm sorry if they are. That's all. Yeah, you know, but but I mean, thing. not a lot. I mean, this this is. Uh, somewhat unorthodox in terms of the the high levels of you know manufactured music that we hear with it yeah, that does well. sound like i mean there's machines that have been built to make things sound perfect right well they're all machines <laughs> now right so so much of music these days is a machine you know it's become a machine and there's so much mechanic in everything it's great to try and you know undo the mechanic you know that's what's i think a lot of people yeah a lot of people are are getting back you know the whole recording studio uh, hierarchy being taken back by everyone making recordings in their houses again. I mean, I don't know. It just seems people are, it, just the practicality of it, it's just too expensive to go to studios. It's bringing people home again, making hmm. records. Who knows what they're making? I mean, I, that's the part I don't really know. It's all happening secretly in those dank basements or whatever. But I think people are maybe more interested in, in that now that they're at home again. They're not worried. We're spending... 800 bucks seems today to polarize. It every seems like second there's more is, and more yeah. manufactured on the one hand and and then that there's the revenge of the the dank basements uh, <laughs> ha happening concomitantly the there's robots recordings. and there's humans you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that's a very stark way to put it anthony <laughs> but but you know at the center of this is still leslie feist i mean w with this film anthony you are included she just said this earlier as as one of these artists feist has put her trust in how do you manage the task of balancing your own artistic needs Mm. with that of the artist you're working with or for, dare I say? Yeah, I don't, you know, artistic needs, I don't know really what those are, tr truthfully. Um, you know, I, I, it's like, it's a process you enter into. This is my artistic need. My artistic need is I love process, you know. So if I'm watching someone in process, I'm in the element, you know, and... I was speaking about this with a friend of mine in LA about filmmaking and we were he was he's been traveling film festivals with this film he's finished all this work and he's like that's the after effect it's the it's when you're in it it's when you're working it's when the thing is going on that that's that's what's exciting you know uh, editing a bit too but really it's that it's that part of it so to me process is process is where there's a lot of truth going down you know and and uh, I, I think that's what's interesting about 
everyone that was involved with this project and talking to them, we got to talk a bit about process and that, that to me is uh, but you have a vision, something. Right? Do I have a vision? Yeah. I can see you. <laughs> no, do I have a vision? I mean, when, yeah, when you're f- We want to do, I wanted, I wanted to do something different. Leslie wanted to do something different. Our vision was let's not make a rock doc. Let's not make a live DVD eight camera shoot. Let's do something interesting. Let's right. make it experimental. Let's use Super 8. Let's see the grain of the film. Let's th- make things alive. Let's have the camera out of focus. That's the vision. The vision is to undo the vision. The vision is to get blurry and try to find some truth within the blur. You know, you know uh, the film is, seems like another artistic, uh, uh, element around you. I mean, you, you're, you've become, uh, uh, certainly with this tour that we see throughout the film, it's a multidisciplinary arts approach. You're, it's, it's like a multimedia arts experience. Uh, visual art being a big part of this, you know, that giant screen behind you and a visual artist working live with you while you... And I wonder if, Leslie, if there's... If, there's, um, if you ever have thought about... Uh, you know, you said earlier that audio comes first for you. You're, this is, you know, you write the songs. That's what your craft is. That's what you've done. Uh, and uh, not to take anything away from the multidisciplinary approach, but does it take anything away from the focus on the music? Do you ever worry about that? Not for you, but for uh, the audience. Hmm. That's a, well, that's a side of the coin. I guess I don't often get a honest glimpse at, you know, um, has anyone ever said, well, that was a pain to have to look at those images? Like, I don't know, maybe, 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 it, you know, there was a certain amount of, um, I I felt, I felt like I could focus on what I was there to do more easily if I didn't feel this gaping um, blank space above my head, especially when you're playing places you know, that big, yeah. you know, it's yeah. like jumbotron hovering above everybody and empty you know, thousands of feet or whatever above right. your head or whatever. So to sort of uh, give a little, you know, people go to see, they say, they, I went to see a show last night. They didn't say I went to hear a show last night. You know, they're, they're there to watch something too. Otherwise right. they'd stay home and listen but to you the know, record. But you know, you, you did the light bright analogy. Uh, this is what, here's, here's what's in my head right now. You know when, when you, you know, remember when the, the jumbotron started to appear and you, you go and you watch the soccer game or the hockey game and you're going to an arena to watch a hockey game, but you end up watching it on the screen. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what we do increasingly, right? Yeah. Do you, that's what I'm talking about. So someone comes to see Feist, and in the middle of one of your songs, we're actually watching something happening. The, uh, artistically, are we taking, I'm just throwing this out there, I don't yeah, are yeah, we yeah. taking our focus away from the experience of the music somehow, if we do that? Well, it's funny because I've played some venues before where there's, uh, whatever the screens at the side, you know, the kind of jumbotron or whatever, the big giant screens at the side, and they're filming the show and putting it on the screen so that people <laughs> at the back can directly see. At you. <laughs> but I mean, I guess that's because otherwise you're an ant or something, right. you know, which I am, an ant, A U N T. No. Um, oh, sorry, I had to. <laughs> um, but, you know, th- that was always something I found really uncomfortable because that's not what the show is, because often the, s- the cameras would just zoom in on our faces and then all of a sudden there's this you know micro close-up of a part of the equation that's just such a tiny piece of the whole or something and in 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 you know when anthony had shot all this footage of course there was cameras at the very back of the rooms and cameras right on stage with us and in in looking at the edit i i was really one of the things i was really trying to make sure was that it was, you know, 95% of the shots of us on stage needed to be big enough so you could see the whole show. I mean, I don't think it's a distracting thing, um, like as opposed to just like nostril shots or whatever. Right, right. But I don't think it's, if, if, the, if the subject matter of what's going on behind is, is, is linked to the songs and, and Clea Miniker, who's a shadow puppeteer who, you know, made all this material and stuff, she, she and I came up with loose, broad strokes concepts of what it was and, it's not a storyline so much. It's sort of non-narrative, broad stroke subplots. It's like visual subtitles or something. So it's linked to the song. It's, an, it's a piece of the puzzle as far as, I mean, I kept talking to her about Aesop's fables or something because you're not dealing with a person. You're not dealing with, um, it, it's more like archetypical, grander, bigger ideas about, you know, Aesop's fables are just sort of the crafty fox and the good, you know, the good goose and the, you know, and what happens is sort of more dealing with like bigger, broader emotions. And in a way, that's what her, you know, the content of her show was. And I thought it, 
it didn't distract. It wasn't like, you know, staccato strobe light video footage or, and it wasn't a close up jumbotron of my face or something. It was actually linked to the, you know, to a deeper vein underneath the lyrics as far as, you know, right. something to look at. So it enhanced it. I, ho- I hope so. Oh, yeah, I, I hope, think so. I guess that's the ultimate hope. <laughs> I think so. I mean, that's see, that the part where they make the heart and you take the heart with your shadow and you bring it into your chest and it starts beating red. I mean, it's pretty, uh, to me, it's extremely lo-fi sophistication, you know, mm. and beautiful. I thought it was an enhancement. I didn't think it was a distraction. What's it like watching this film for you? Uh, you know, so much of it's focused on the reminder, uh, or a lot of it, and that's 2007 and that collective experience that you had. How do you feel like you've changed or grown, or do you? How do you see yourself when you watch this film now? Um, well, what I think makes me able to come you know, on the radio and talk about it and get behind it and feel proud enough to feel like I can present it next to Anthony is that. It's really not about me, which is great because in all the working with those people, we're, we're, we're talking about what we're doing. We're, we're dealing with, you know, we got to move that table over there. Wait, let's get, we need to have another scrim brought in that needs to be taller or like, hey, that light's too bright. Wait a sec. Where's the, you know, the giant jumbo can of tomato puree that we're going to clean out and then paint black and put a light we're going to build inside it you know the, just this sort of stuff of the doing you're just doing it you're just like putting all the pieces together or whatever and you know that was I didn't get to talk to those people that I got to do all of those those brief potent collaborative moments with about what they were really thinking about you know and what what it meant to them and when in context of their b- greater body of work or and the kind of deeper concepts we were more honing in on the common vocabulary that can exist between sound and making a video right. or something that's just straight up commercial as w- what else are videos for you know i guess in a crass way they're just to draw attention you know wave a flag but you the, but you are say, in a look lot at of this, this record film. there's a lot of there's interview there's a, a very deep interview with you or, or uh, probing or <laughs> evocative oh interview God. with you <laughs> not a probing <laughs> <laughs> it's not an ambush well, interview but you know, there's, <laughs> there's an evocative interview with you there's a there's a uh, there's you and a number of um uh uh, organic environments doing what you do I mean what what do you learn about what have you learned about you and well that's it I know you're, it's, you're I was trying to tiptoe off on the edge there and you brought me back but I but I but do. you asked actually your initial question was how do what do I learn when I watch it or how do yeah, I feel when I yeah. watch it I'm not watching for the me parts I'm, I I know that I was necessary as glue to contextualize all these people. And I needed to be in the film so that you would understand. But for me, it's just zero, I have zero interest in reframing my state of mind or talking about what, oh, the oh the spotlight, oh, allow me to hide. Like all that stuff is just like really boring to me. It's just not what I think about. It's not what I'm hmm. interested about. It's not how I, it's not how you live your life. You know, it's right. not the things in the morning you get up and you're just living you're, and, and hopefully still feeling something worth making, you know, the next, pull the next rabbit out are of the hat. Are you saying, well, I agree with, I, mean, I think you're tiptoeing a little bit still because I, are you saying, because I, <laughs> I mean, there's only a few opportunities that one would ever get to reflect like that. You're right. I mean, I, I, right. I don't think you're brushing your teeth going, hmm, let me reflect about in the last two decades and how have I changed it? But, you know, you put out a memoir or you shoot mm-hmm. a documentary about yourself, you know, or uh, that you're involved in. I mean, that, that, you know, that's a moment where where you're, you can reflect. And are you saying that you, there isn't one point in the film where you go, oh man, I can't believe I said that or that's me or I did that? Well, let's see. Am I gonna let you ensnare me? Yes, I will. <laughs> no, I think that, um, I think that there was a certain um, uh, rewriting of history maybe that that was able to be done in uh, it was i'm not rewriting because it's just all what happened but reframing it because my experience of that period in my life was really different than the film the film's uh side of the story Mm. my my experience was a lot of boring stuff like being tired and uh whatever you know just sort of feeling i mean like you were saying about the making being the interesting part as anthony was saying um there is a certain thing about touring where you can feel like you're making a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy and eventually it's just you don't even see the original image anymore and and so my experience of feeling this degeneration of an original thought or a, the the 
you know, the first eureka of like, oh, I have this song and I love this melody and now I'm going to sing it 900 times. You know, it's, a, it's sort of, um, it's a thing that was changing everything for me. So my experience was, was like that. It's just dealing with trying to, trying to keep a core right. and finding Clea and, and all these people that I worked with, they helped me, you know, draw lines between all those dots and reconstruct uh, uh, something that was relevant, more relevant to me and get back something that gets lost with the sort of de degeneration of time and re repetition. So on that note, if, so, yeah. if, if Leslie Feist today could swoop, swoop in uh, to five years ago or sometime in the past and whisper into uh, the younger Fe uh, Feist's ear uh, some advice, what would she say? I don't know. When you said younger, I almost wanted to say younger and wiser because there's something to be said for the not knowing thing when you just have fuel. You don't have too much uh, experience. You're just coming at it with some sort of, uh, wow. you know, some sort of pure fuel, like jet fuel. You're just yeah. psyched and you're just going and you don't, you're not thinking too much about it. And you're not definitely not factoring on factoring in all of this external perception of what you're doing. There's you're not feeling observed. You're just there's a, there's a wisdom to that naive just go for it iveness. You know, is that a new word? Go for it iveness. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> See, still at it. Feist, so creating, I would, innovating. I would ask her to whisper into my ear, probably. I love that is a brilliant <laughs> answer, Leslie Feist. <laughs> Thank you. Anthony, this I mean, this has been such a journey for you. Uh, this is it's a it's a beautiful film. It's a poetic film I think uh, what what did you learn through this whole process I mean is it can if you were to encapsulate what you came out of this h how you came out of this uh, uh, growing what would it be well I mean you were just talking about redundancy you know and fighting boredom and those kind of things and I think I think one of those things that sort of was created on this on on doing this whole thing was a a, a sense of play and I think that's something you like to do. I think you like to instill play, and I think play is really important as an artist to keep moving. And I think what this film let me do is continue to play, and I just want to keep playing. So yeah. <laughs> you sound like you have a really good life, <laughs> a really good perspective. You know, guy gets to play. That's not so bad. Guy gets to play. Absolutely, the guy gets to play, man. Are you kidding? That's what it's all about. You know. It kind of is. It's sort of true. I mean, it's just such a wonderful, rare thing to find common-minded people who are at a point where they can let go of taking themselves too seriously and just, you know, joke around and sort of focus all of that youthful, you know, hope into something and have have the years of skills to be able to pull it off. But at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, like bring come at it with a certain twinkle in your eye. When, when I see all these. Uh, uh, incredibly talented people that are surrounding you uh, in, in your career and in this film that we see them and I mean this with absolute respect I mean you know I adore the, the work you, that you do as an artist when you've reached the level of success you have do you ever feel guilty that so many people working with you didn't get the same credit for their achievements uh, that you do well yeah which is why we made this film. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you kind of was that more obvious than I thought. You hit the nail on the head because, I, yeah, I felt it was. Uh, I don't know. It's really. It's like trying to talk about the labyrinth while you're in the labyrinth or something. It's really hard to. I I, I so would I don't want to come across as not appreciative or something, but there's a certain fallacy to being. Um, I don't know, to being lauded or or raised up on the platform or or focused on even even in the way that we're doing in this interview right now, there's a focus between your, you know, formidable mind that I listen to every day, speaking to people in this way and, and, and me and, you know, why am I sitting here and, and why isn't the interview being conducted with the photographer? Why is she or or Patrick, the director, or all of these people whose minds are equally as formidable or as um, who are doing totally interesting work. It's just not as interesting or as accessible to, you know, like Joe Blow on the street who might be curious about something. What he's presented to be curious about is usually a pop culture context thing, you know? And, and, uh, and I saw myself being absorbed into that a little bit, and I saw my name being a little bit detached from me. A hologram started to be projected of me that I could all of a sudden observe from the outside, and it just became so weird. I mean, that's, that's something that, uh, that 
it's just it's just a different way to see yourself. Mm. All of a sudden, you see yourself from the outside, or you see what you've done, or your body of work. And as Simone Ruby says in the film, you as you put more of yourself into the world, you want it to be more multidimensional because you don't want to become th paper thin. You don't want uh, to feel yourself turn into a single point of light or something, mm. you know. And um, yeah, I, I felt it felt unfair for for all of these people that uh, that I knew were toiling away, working hard, that their only satisfaction was gonna come from seeing the work done. And I get satisfied from that too. I see the work being done and there's some satisfaction with that, but I was also had this whole other thing that was happening to me and that my day-to-day ex -day experience was shifting around. And they that wasn't happening to them. I mean, there's something great when all of a sudden Mary Rossi's mom is in Starbucks and sees the photo she knows Mary took. You know, there's But that's her mom. It's not like her entire community of, of peers, you know? Right. But that's kind of life, isn't it? I mean, every star has a bunch of people who work on their every careers. Every rose has <laughs> its thorns. Here, oh, they're thorns. Here's, yeah. here's what I wanted to, <laughs> how, how afraid are you of getting too comfortable? How scared of you are you are you of that? Uh, um, I, I, I don't think that that's gonna be a problem for me. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know, I just, um, I'm always ripping to shreds things that I've become too sure of because I get concerned that I'm looking from too narrow of a perspective or something. So with that comes like constant <laughs> turmoil mm. in terms of the way I perceive things. But, um, you know, at least I, I never, I, I'm not going to just put my feet up and feel like I've gotten somewhere that's not just en route, you know? Anthony, tell me about uh, what happens now when you've spent this much of your last few years? It hasn't all been four years. I mean, I oh, got okay. a chance to go have a burger and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, how, many, how many times have you had that chance? Never, uh, quite often, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you keep minimizing. You've made a, you know, I think you've made a great film that took a long time to make. It feels sure. like... Why don't you like the spotlight, Anthony? I love the spotlight. Try it on. <laughs> I'm fine with it. No, um, my question is going to be where you go now. I mean, do you feel, do, does it? Do you feel like you, you, you're going to chronicle the next phase? Am I going to become a fisherman in Newfoundland? <laughs> yeah, um, There's nothing wrong with that. No, I believe me. It's a, it's a, it's a valid choice. Um, where and do I go a now? Storyteller. This, I think that I got to speak on your behalf because I'm not sure you're going to say something to decide. You're going to. Tiptoe around. I'm not tiptoeing. I talked about Africa. Anthony's a storyteller. He's a, a you know beautiful writer of narrative, amazing stories. And I think that now you need to make some films. You're, you're working on some films, I'm like feature films, films that don't involve singers. You know. Oh, they may. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about that? Wait Maybe a he's minute. One cotton pick a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, sorry to co-opt your answer there. But Can I answer my own question, please? There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeez, you only have me. like a minute and a half now. You oh, see, no. we sorry, ate oh a minute and a half with that. What she said. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I'm writing. I spent the year, I promised myself I'd spend the year writing, which I didn't. I got one, I got one and a half done scripts, and I was going to try to do three. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the, you know. It's been a long process, and I got to say, this film, you know, it's like I'm in my 40s. I wanted to start making feature films in my 20s. Thank God I didn't. Thank God it's the, the courage is coming up now, and this film has been a really great part of uh, helping that courage boost. So, yeah, I'd love to make one. Nicely done. And then, and speaking of writing, uh, the dreaded question about the next record, Leslie Feist. I'm just going to audition to be in Anthony's film about a singer. <laughs> you come in See, I'm end. trying not to You're talk about the record. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going to make a record this winter. Where are you working on it? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it in my head right now. <laughs> but, um, but I, yeah, I'm going to begin you know, when the first snow falls. I think that's my cue. It's really nice to have you both here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Nice Thanks film, you kids. Interest. Good work. Thank you. That is Canadian singer-songwriter extraordinaire Feist and filmmaker Anthony Seck. Their film, Look at What the Light Did Now, is available now on DVD, and they've both joined me here live in Studio Q.